hi guys and welcome to this video i hope you're all doing super super well thank you so much once again for joining me right here on my channel so today guys in this video we are going to be covering the case of the grace road church this was a case that took place on an island called fiji and initially some people may think okay grace road church it doesn't really sound like something that could be intimidating or scary but what was behind the name of this cult because it was a cult was something a lot more sinister so without further ado guys let's get into the cult of grace road church guys i'm going to put out a disclaimer that there is quite a high level of violence uh that's been used within this cult so for anyone who again is very very sensitive to that um, please be aware of that before watching this video today. We are going to be visiting or going to the island of Fiji and when people hear about Fiji I know that when I definitely have heard about Fiji it resembles a tropical paradise. It's an island that's very close to Australia and people go there for holidays, for honeymoons and that is what I also knew of Fiji until i discovered grace road church south korea is actually very well known for its very strange and bizarre cults actually and a lot of the cults that have managed to operate in south korea it's taken a very long time for the practices that they're actually doing to rise to the surface and this cult is no different it was initially a south korean cult that was developed by a pastor called shin ok ju Shin Okju ok was actually a female pastor. Now, I know a lot of the South Korean cults actually have male cult leaders, but unusually in this case, it is a female cult leader. So Shin jok -u was a kind of middle-aged female pastor that had a cult in South Korea. And there's not much talk of like her having a relationship or a husband, but there is talk of her son, who I believe was called Daniel Kim. And so she established this kind of church, which was clearly not a church, but she established a church in South Korea. She had about 400 to 600 followers attending this church. So it was not one of the biggest cults in the world, but, you know, it's not, it, I would say it's a sizable cult for, you know, someone that's established a cult. Now, it's always the case, guys, that at the beginning of cults, it never starts with a high level of violence or abuse these perpetrators of cults like Shin Okju, ok you know, ease their congregation members into the cult until they've entirely brainwashed them essentially, right? So it started off very kind of, you know, passively and she was kind of ring doing a remix and a reinterpretation of what the Bible is. So, you know, in the case of these cults, guys, we always see cult leaders remixing, I call it remixing, religious books or holy books and religions so Shin, jo Shin Okju was no different this is what she was doing she was doing a whole reinterpretation of the bible and christianity so what happened is while Shin Okju had estab established her cult in South Korea and she was South Korean um, she got the well kind of managed to somehow indoctrinate her congregation of four to six hundred followers to a level where they became highly obedient towards her and at this stage I w as i said guys there wasn't like a what well, i as far as i'm aware a high level of violence but they were really mentally already under her control so what she started telling her congregation is that and it's again it's always the case guys is that she was the savior you know she's here to to save everyone and if they want to be saved in this life they need to follow what she is telling them to follow which is this reinterpretation of the bible and everything and she started explaining to them that there's going to be a famine in south korea and they need to all leave south korea because else they're going to be you know essentially absorbed into this whole famine situation oh i forgot to mention guys sorry that the cult was established in 2002 so it's not a really old cult right so anyway she's explaining to her congregation that there's going to be this huge famine in south korea which to be honest is very difficult in my opinion personally to believe that because south korea is a country which has gone from strength to strength economically 
and there are people who are in poverty but there are also people who are doing extremely well financially and the country is definitely not at risk of having a famine anyway now because of this potential impending famine she has said to her congregation that they need to now find another country to escape to so what she does is she sends out one of the congregation she calls them a missionary on this mission to find another country that they can relocate to and apparently the missionary visits up to 60 countries like the missionary goes there in person and visits about 60 countries before they decide where to relocate to so anyway guys after x amount of time so now we've got to 2014 the missionary has come back and said ah oh, you know what if we relocate to the island of fiji now apparently this was the god chosen island this was the savior island country where they could all be saved from this famine in south korea right so the missionaries come back told shin okju this information and shin okju is like yeah let's all relocate to fiji so you would think guys that as a cult leader she's just going to go and take just a few members of the congregation with her but shin okju didn't work like that right she's like the whole congregation need to come with me so about 400 of her congregation went with her and all relocated to the island of fiji so they were to get their passports they were to get on planes and the whole entire cult relocated to the island of fiji so anyway she's got to the island of fiji now she's re-established the grace road church you know in fiji and in fiji there is quite a few church like christian churches so a lot of people are Christians there and so they established their Grace Road Church. So initially some people could think, OK, this might fit in quite well because there's already quite a few churches established there. There's quite a big Christian community. So this is a cult that can easily potentially go under the radar. And in my opinion, I think that they established it there. One, because it was a nice little tropical island. No one's going to suspect a cult there. And two, as I said, because there was already a lot of Christian churches there. So from an outsider's perspective, this is just another Christian church. Now, all these congregation members start attending and then the church actually starts growing. So more and more people start attending this church. There's a lot of other Korean members that start attending and progressively she sets up all these businesses in Fiji. So like restaurants and like a kind of agricultural kind of business as well. And all these other little commerces, right? So not only is she running the church, she's got all these businesses going on. This woman, she's like a proper, you know, like dodgy kind of businesswoman, right? Because this is in 2014, guys. This is a more modernised way that she's developed this cult in brackets, okay? So she's got all these little businesses going on. So she's not just got her congregation following her. She's got cult members within these businesses as well so from the onset people could think right there's all these new restaurants that have opened in fiji these little commerces little businesses like hair salons and things like that and people would just think right this is these are just standard businesses great there's new shops new things opening in fiji so that's more places for people to shop right so again from the onset people think this is amazing and from a cult perspective and business perspective she did it in a way where again it was much easier for to go, her to go under the radar because she's got all these businesses established and she could just like look like she's kind of like a pastor businesswoman essentially right and she's employed like in the end like hundreds and thousands of employees in all of these businesses so not only is it creating um jobs for her congregation members but she's creating also jobs for you know original fijians that were on the island so she's giving people jobs so you know again from the onset this could seem like something really positive because she's developing business for the island right however as i was saying earlier not only her initial congregation so her 400 members that came with her to fiji were part of this cult but all these employees in the all these different businesses were also under her control because not only is she an employer she's a cult leader now you would think guys that cult leaders and as far as i'm aware when i've watched a lot of documentaries about cults research cults etc 
when they're perpetrating abuse or violence they try to conceal it they don't want outsiders to know about it so they'll often tell their actual congregation to lie if someone asks them if they're experiencing abuse for example and the congregation will be like no no i've never experienced abuse no no this is not a cult blah blah in this case a big difference was that pastor shin okju was perpetrating violence on her congregation and this was all being posted online and there were videos everywhere like it was normal to perpetrate violence and she didn't even want to hide it so what was happening is a lot of her church services right were being filmed and in these church services she would be preaching saying that people need to have total obedience for her and do everything that she basically says right because else they're not going to be saved and all of this right but also she would say that some of the congregation members practically all of them basically have got the devil in them have got some kind of evil spirit in them and as such they need to have this evil spirit essentially taken out of them and essentially she explained that the only way to get these evil kind of spirits out of anyone was to apparently pull them by their hair so put get them to get on the ground on their knees pull them by their hair and start slapping them across the face continuously and when i say slapping them guys this was like very aggressive like when i came across this cult and i was randomly doing research into cults and this this video just popped up essentially randomly and this was the first thing I saw of this cult. I hadn't even read anything. I just saw a video pop up and it was her perpetrating this violence. And I thought, gosh, like this woman is aggressive, literally. She would also just randomly start chopping off their hair with scissors in the middle of the service as well, which again, from any church that I know of, I've never seen people just start cutting off all people's hair, pulling their hair and everything. But this is what she did. This is what she did all the time in a high majority of services is cut people's hair off with scissors, pull their hair and just start, you know, like shaking them about by their head and hitting them across the face multiple times until they would fall on the floor. And there's instances, I mean, this would happen all the time, where she would beat these people so severely, and after she's beaten them, she would be crying, like, I don't know, she's, she's like pretending to cry or whatever. And then the congregation members would start crying, and then the person that she's actually just been beaten, they would then go and hug her for this, as in they need to thank her because she's beaten them and apparently got this evil spirit out of them and then there are cases where she would have people like shackled to a bed and she would be beating them and there would be other congregation members observing and there was a guy that was chained to a bed for so long and he was experiencing all this abuse that in the end he had to have his legs amputated because he got an infection and got gangrene so he ended up having to have his legs amputated because of this woman one of the members that actually spoke out against her said that he was 17 when he joined grace road church in south korea and this is when she was telling all these 400 members that they're going to have to go to fiji and relocate and this member was only 17 at the time so he was a minor right and he ended up being one of the members that transitioned over to Fiji. And I'm thinking like, how has she managed to ensure that even a minor who's got no other family members in the cult leave South Korea for Fiji and they're under the age of 18? Like this woman had such a level of control. Now, when they all arrived as well in Fiji, she took away, as well as the higher members of the congregation, took away all the passports of these 400 South Korean members that had all, all come from South Korea, right? So they took away all of their passports. So these people were like literally at the mercy because one, they've gone to Fiji where they don't speak the language there or they don't speak English, whatever. So of course they're in a country where they don't speak the language. They've now got no id documents so they can't travel anywhere or escape because they don't have any id and this woman's keeping all these passports and then 
they are now working for her and they were working up to 14 hours a day in kind of forced labor conditions they're not getting paid and they're being beaten all of the time and as her businesses started to grow she wanted more investors for her businesses so for all these like restaurants agricultural businesses and all of this right and actually for one of her businesses i think it was one of the agricultural ones they even won an award in fiji right anyway she because she wanted to develop the businesses more she wanted to get investors right so she went to the government of fiji and asked for a level of you know financial investment from them and i just want to say guys that at the time when she requested these investments from the government of fiji there were already these videos circulating of her beating people in the church and in other churches in uh, fiji a lot of the pastors there were warning their congregations about grace road church and about this pastor because it was so rife what was going on like literally everyone on the island knew about this cult right so now she's gone to ask the government for financial investment and that particular prime minister at the time that was ruling over fiji sort of saw it like right she's bringing a lot of business to the island it's attracting more tourism and the gdpr like the financial status of the island is really growing so he was like this is really beneficial even though <clears throat> as i said guys all these things were circulating about her and the cult there were videos online about this the prime minister decided that they were going to invest in her businesses which is you know unbelievable and i think one of the reasons that the government decided to invest in her businesses and support her not just because of tourism etc it was because it was discovered that she had construction businesses as well and her construction businesses were the ones that were extending the offices of the government and the prime minister at that time so they kind of had a kind of under the undercover kind of deal going on between them and so the government invested in more of her businesses now progressively cult members started leaving because they couldn't take the level of violence specifically anymore because this would be happening in every service that she would do like it wasn't just oh should do this once a month it was every single service that she's doing right and then people working 14 hours a day every day and being beaten and it was just too much so people started leaving yeah the more people that left the more that this abuse level got exposed and progressively the islanders of fiji so the original inhabitants of the island there they started to like get sick of what she was doing and the way that the government was supporting her and you know everything that she was doing on on the island started to piss off all the fijians so all these protests started on the island <clears throat> and there were a lot of petitions saying that they wanted all these people protesting saying that they wanted her off the island they didn't want her there anymore and this went on for some time like it was a lot of the population protesting actually against this and so a lot of the cult members they wanted to go back to south korea they also wanted to leave fiji like the ones who'd left and stuff they wanted to actually go back to fiji but because this woman had kept all their passports they couldn't leave fiji right so this whole immigration sort of situation started and this started again to rise the profile of the cult because you know now you've got an immigration situation going on as well so this is where all these investigations started to happen more and more videos of the violence came out there was even a video that was actually released by her son kim showing all of this violence right and saying but my mother is doing this but she's not doing it to the congregation against their will like the congregation want her to do this to them and quite honestly i don't know how anyone would would want someone to treat them like this okay but her son put out this video of her perpetrating more violence which to be honest i'm thinking like that wasn't very clever on his part because you're just showing your mum beating more people essentially so if you thought this was going to back your mum up, that was actually quite stupid. So anyway, more and more of these investigations started and there was a sort of case that was opened 
and this woman got investigated, the cult got investigated, but in the end, there were no charges brought against her or the cult. And a lot of people say, again, guys, it's because the government of Fiji and the prime minister were kind of doing this under deal, under the table deal at the time with her. And so they wouldn't close down this cult, even though all of this was going on, right? So then in the end, the Korean, South Korean government got involved because there were all these members that wanted to get back to South Korea and couldn't, and they were actually South Korean citizens. So South Korea got involved because it's now an immigration issue and was saying that they want her expedited to South Korea to hold a trial, um, you know, a criminal court trial in regards to her, and they want Fiji to expedite her and expedite all of these uh, congregation members back to South Korea. And Fiji was like, well, firstly, how are we going to do this? Because there's 400 of them. It's not like two or three people. And we don't essentially want to be involved. And so the Fijian government actually didn't want to cooperate with South Korea on this case. And so this made it a really complex case, you know, internationally, because you've got two countries one that wants the cult leader expedited to their country with all the congregation and the country that they're actually in is refusing to expedite them and in a high majority of cases where someone is held in a country and they've committed criminal offences the country where the person the perpetrator is will generally agree to expedite them to their original country of origin because they don't want criminals in their country so they'll expedite the person back to their original country but in this case the Fijian government did not want to expedite her because she was bringing a lot of you know financial gain to the Fiji Fijian government in the end what happened is South Korea man managed to enforce that she was expedited back to South Korea along with all these other members and got them to be able to get their passports back so they were expedited as well right so this was around 2018 and then in 2019 the whole trial started in South Korea where this Shin ok -ju leader had to take the stand and answer for what she'd done and all these allegations of abuse, etc., etc. Sometimes, guys, in criminal cases, or especially in the case of cults, sometimes it can get, it can be very difficult to have, you know, victims testify because they have a fear still of cult leaders, which is, you know, understandable, um, or they've been so severely traumatized and abused that they just don't want to relive you know those things by having to recount them again so it can be difficult to get victims to testify however in this case there were loads of victims that came out to testify in this trial like they didn't mind testifying there was a lot of them and this woman was convicted only with six years of prison now some people would say okay there were no actual murders discovered in this case and it was all adults involved and there weren't really any children etc however let's recall that there was the young boy who was 17 who's a minor he wasn't classified as an adult but there were no small children involved in this case and apparently all these people accepted being beaten willingly as well but in my opinion these people were being beaten in brackets willingly because they were vulnerable they were probably at vulnerable times in their lives and a lot of people who end up in cults, they're in a vulnerable situation at the time, which is why they fall prey to cults in the first place, right? And the fact, guys, that there is so much video footage, still even online now, there's loads of it, you know, proving what this woman has done to her, her, her victims, and that that wasn't enough to give her a longer sentence is unbelievable to be honest this woman was sentenced in july 2019 as of me recording this this is june 2024 and that means that by july 2025 so next year she's going to be released from prison and i think some people like to have that kind of viewpoint that you know people can change they commit crimes and then they change over time and this and this 
and I've said it before guys on my channel personally because I've experienced trauma and abuse as well physically and mentally that I personally do not believe that these types of people can be rehabilitated and because her se sentence is so short as well I, I feel that it's not enough time for her to reflect on her behaviour before she's released from prison because the sentence is so short. If she had like a 30 year sentence at least, maybe she'd have some time to reflect. But six years? This is a very short sentence. In South Korea, as I said earlier, guys, is very prolific for cults. Like this is something, again, Korea, South Korea, Japan, China have a lot of cults going on, especially in Japan and South Korea. And there's so many because the way that it's masked in those countries is something that's more kind of like cultural and spiritual. And so these cult leaders get away with it for years and years and years. And the laws in those countries are not yet powerful enough to deal with these individuals. And it is really a situation where the laws specifically in regards to cults and cult leaders really need to be under review in these countries specifically. And so guys, that was the story of the Grace Road Church cult. Now, it was really, again, difficult to find more information, guys, on Shin ok Ju in this case. I couldn't find much about her past. Not really much is known before the point that she creates this church and then she's got her son that's involved, basically, right? But when I discovered this case, I just felt like I had to cover it because after I saw the videos of what goes on, I, I, I was just like, how is there so much of this online? But this woman only got six years in prison, right?